key modern railways. In-depth railway news. Hello and uh, welcome to a rather rural modern railways podcast. Uh, today we're down by the River Trent and the canal and uh, by Middle Main Line. Which, of course, is the line with the best case for electrification in the country. So, uh, first off, we're going to go over to speak to the editor, Philip Sherratt, who's just a few miles down the line that way, uh, uh, down near Attenborough Wildlife Park. Now, bear with him, he will leap into shot. So, uh, here he comes now. Over to you, Philip. Thanks very much Ian and uh, good to see you all again everyone for another video this month to talk about the next issue of Modern Railways magazine. First of all, uh, just, I've come down, I live on the western edge of Nottingham and this is Attenborough Nature Reserve. Um, I've got the railway line here, behind me is into Nottingham and that train that's gone through is a Nottingham to London, East Midlands service. So that's just approaching Attenborough Junction and then Trent East where it will take um, Fork leftwards uh, towards East Midlands Parkway and then on south towards Leicester and London. And then uh, here, here next to me is the nature reserve with the lake and you can just see behind me the spire of the church at St Mary's at Attenborough. So this is quite a famous photographic location you might recognise. So uh, I thought I'd come down to the line side again and, um, and tell you a little bit about what's in the next issue of the magazine. Uh, it's not very East Midlands focused. Uh, the only parallel I can draw between our focus on um, Great Western is that HSTs, which are still operating on this line, uh, were on the Great Western, of course, in many numbers and have now been replaced by new trains and we're about to get that up here. Um, but one interesting thing about the Great Western is that obviously there was a recast timetable in December 2019 uh, with major changes to take advantage of the new uh, Hitachi Intercity Express trains. Uh, but that doesn't mean that all everything has stopped on the Great Western and there's lots still going on and there's lots to report for us to report on in the new issue. So as well as the great new Great Western Direct to World franchise, which started in April, uh, there's ambitions for improvements in the Metro West uh, project in Bristol uh, for the Devon Metro around Exeter. Uh, on the North Cotswold line. We've got an update on the coastal resilience works at Dawlish where they're raising the sea wall. That's just coming on in phases and phase one's coming to an end, but there's plenty more still to happen. So there's lots to report on, on the Great Western and that's the main focus of the features. But we've got some uh, lots of added extras for you this month, including a free pullout map that's it's extracted from the new rail atlas that Cressy Publishing have produced. Thanks to them for allowing us to um, put that into the magazine. So that's, a, that's for you all. And we've also got a supplement on HS2 about the rolling stock and that's sponsored by Bombardier and Hitachi who are bidding together as a joint venture. So we thank them for their support uh, with that as well. So there's, um, there's lots of added value for you in the issue of the magazine and um, I really hope that uh, you'll enjoy it and that you'll find it easy to get hold of. Now shops are open but you can also order it online and you can subscribe as well. So there's plenty to enjoy. So I'm just going to close off for you. Um, we're about to get uh, f bombed by an HST here. Uh, this is an empty stop working that's come from Nottingham. So that set's just worked up from London and is going back from Nottingham back to Edges Park Depot in Derby and you'll notice it's got the red power cars as used to operate with LNER uh, which have now come over here uh, with their MTU engines. Um, so we are seeing some changes on our row in East Midlands, there's lots more to come and we'll focus on that in due course. But in, for the meantime, that's the August issue of Modern Railways. Thanks very much for joining us and I'll hand back to Ian. Okay, thank you Philip, and uh, plenty in there to be going on with. Now then, my pan up column. In pan up this month, we're looking at the key train requirements document, which to my amazement I see has been around for 10 years and unfortunately it's been largely ignored in that time despite my efforts to promote it. Uh, key train requirements came about when so many things kept going wrong with new train designs, mainly because people are specifying them who hadn't done it before, and probably more importantly, didn't speak to people who had done it before. So that was quite a problem. Unfortunately, it still is a problem because we need to get the KTR document more into common use. Now, it's not just a tedious report because I talk about the various things that are going on. Little, there's a little obvious stuff like let's not make the window pillars too thick, 
and the RSSB work on seat comfort has now gone into the report. But there's an awful lot more on ride, noise, all sorts of things that make a terrific difference to rolling stock if only people would learn the lessons of what's gone before. Uh, one of the things that's new in the document is a commitment to automatic train preparation and trying to make sure that new trains are suitable for that. And that's a great idea because currently we have drivers wandering about reception sidings and such like, starting trains up and getting ready for service because a lot of things do go wrong overnight for some unknown reason. And uh, rather than that, we could actually get the trains to prep themselves. They could open and close doors, flush toilets, without a driver even being there, and they could report their own faults back to control. So this would be a massive advantage and it'd save you a lot in drivers on uh, driver's hours and that's always worth doing because driver's hours are pretty expensive. Meanwhile, back on the uh, middle main line, more diesel engines are whizzing past us and that's got to be the way of things for the future. And because my second bit of uh, pan up is a little look of the wonderful world post-Covid. Because I, I keep hearing people saying, oh, this is going to be much better. We're going to have a great reset and so on after Covid. We're going to have a, a much better world and everything else. Well, it's a nice thought, but of course, there's going to be no money to make a lot of it happen, which is a bit of a problem. But then there is a bit of good news around, which is it looks like the railway is starting to come under one controlling function. It's network rail, but at least it's one function. And I've had a little thought, think about, well, what difference could that make to some of the things that are going on at the moment? And just for example, batteries. If the same person is paying for the batteries and the expensive heavy trains that have to carry them and renewing them every five years at 200 grand a pop, are they then going to think, maybe we'd be better off putting a wire up and that will solve the problem completely, more efficient and in the long run, cheaper. So if we could have one person in charge, that might make all the difference. We've got a nice sunny day here, but even with all of this sun that's falling here, that is nowhere near enough to power a train. And I think we can be pretty sure that Network Rail can work that out and get the decimal point in the right place. Anyway, over now to Roger Ford. This month's Informed Sources uh, starts with a very popular feature that's been running for over 20 years, and that is, who runs the railway? I started this analysis uh, in 1997, uh, shortly after privatisation, the aim being to see just whether uh, private sector entrepreneurs were going to come in and uh, take over from the fuddy-duddy old railwayman. And the latest analysis shows that uh, around two-thirds or more of the train operating companies and the network rail routes and regions are run by career railwaymen and railway women. And I think that's, uh, that's good news. Uh, less good news, in fact, uh, thoroughly bad news, is I've been doing more analysis, yet more analysis of the government's emergency measures agreements, payments to the train operating companies. As you know, the train operating companies give what revenue they've got to the government, and the government covers all their costs. And uh, I've worked out the uh, subsidy or the, the payments to each TOC, and then used that to work out the uh, cost per the subsidy per journey. And the numbers are pretty scary. And I think that explains why uh, in July, the government finally uh, abandoned the message, do not travel unless it's essential and replaced it with travel safely uh, this summer. They really need the money. Following that is uh, innovation. As you know, both Ian Wormsley and I are innovation skeptics and uh, a new round of funding has just been announced and one or two of the items further fuel my skepticism. I have a bit of fun with uh, a, new, a new first uh, glass fibre reinforced polymer bridge, which is of course the first new uh, all glass fibre polymer bridge since the first all new polymer fibre glass bridge in 2011 and that of course followed the first polymer bridge uh, back in 2007. But there are some interesting items also being funded and I cover them too. Following that is informed sources laws. Now most people know informed sources third law, mistrust all forecasts based on the seasons, but in fact there are 11 laws based on my experience in the railway industry and we've uh, printed out a uh, sheet of them so you can copy it and keep it in your wallet for easy reference and I also explain some of the background to how the laws came along. Finally, there's Tinwatch, my monthly analysis of the reliability of the new trains coming into service. Uh, not much has happened really this week, this month, 
And um, I, it looks as though instead of the bathtub curves you're supposed to get, where failures drop rapidly to uh, the expected level, what we've got is more like a shower tray. So that's informed sources for August, and back to you, Ian. That's it for today, and uh, look forward to seeing you on next month's podcast uh, when we'll be previewing the September edition. How fast it all passes. Bye, everybody. Visit www.keymodernrailways.com for more interesting and essential information about the British Railway Network.